Okay, here we go. We're in chapter 13, almost done on the home stretch. And this is our fourth chapter that's focused on geometry nodes, specifically triangle nodes and quadrilaterals. And these are high performance nodes that are uh, very useful, very uh, a bit specialized, and require uh, a little attention to detail because the concepts involved are, are not so much different as much as slightly different from one to the other and we have to pay extra, uh, extra care to make sure that we get it right. Our quote for this chapter, appropriately I, I hope, is uh, a very famous quote regarding geometry and that's uh, the, perhaps the father of geometry, uh, Euclid, who was a tutor to King Ptolemy of uh, Egypt. And when the king asked his tutor, well, do I really have to do all this work? Can't I just do the, the short story, the, the easy way, to the, the executive summary for this, to learn geometry? Hmm. Sound familiar? Uh, Euclid replied, uh, No, Your Majesty, there is no royal road to geometry. We have to do the work if you really want to understand it. So, here we are. Let's do some work. Okay, uh, consistent chapter structure for uh, number 13 here. And uh, let's go then into the overview. We start out with a review of some of the fields, and these are. Uh, hopefully quite familiar to you by this point. Again, this is the fourth chapter we've done in geometry and uh, you've seen some of these fields before. Solid, the counterclockwise field, color per vertex, and normal per vertex, whether or not there's one value for each point in a polygon or one value for each polygon itself, meaning a third or a quarter of the values needed. Okay, once we get through our uh, review, then we'll get into normals, uh, also known as uh, perpendiculars, the, uh, the right angle vectors that can be defined for any flat polygon, and, and how we use those in the lighting equation. Okay, then, then we're into the nodes, and you'll see a pattern here. You'll see that uh, triangle set, Triangle fan set, triangle strip set, those are variations on a theme. They simply do quadri triangles. And then quad set does uh, quadrilaterals, four pointed polygons. Okay, and then the second pattern we'll see, the second form of repetition in this chapter is the corresponding nodes, index triangle set, index triangle fan set index triangle strip and index quad set. Okay, they do the same thing as the other nodes but in a slightly different way. We first use uh, simply the ordering of polygons. What's the order of the vertices? And we just use them one after another after another after another to define what our shape is. Contrast that with the indexed nodes which again do the same things, can draw the same polygons, but instead of doing it brute force one polygon at a time, they'll take a pile of, of coordinates and point vertex by vertex by vertex, perhaps in different orders. Okay? So this indexing lets us be a little more efficient in how we retrieve points and reuse them. Okay? So two styles, two ways of doing business. Somewhat familiar, we've seen the indexing before in indexed face set and indexed line set. And um, this is how we can put triangles and quadrilaterals together when we want to get right down into the nitty gritty of what's the geometry that we're drawing. Now, just as there's uh, no royal road to geometry, you do need to pay attention, pay close attention to detail in here. And it's not that every one of them is a whole new concept. No, it's every one of them is, is quite consistent. There's a lot of coherency, consistency in the design and in the usage and the application of these. However, there are small 
differences, maybe even idiosyncrasies between each. And so if you want them to work, you have to uh, pay attention to uh, those specific details on the usage of each node. Okay, so that's what the chapter is about. Let's go. Uh, so for our concepts, we do have lots and lots of different geometry nodes in X3D. Vive la différence. That's good to have different capabilities at your fingertips, a different palette of nodes that you can draw and render with. Okay, and here they are, uh, spaced throughout the book, uh, increasing uh, uh, value and complexity as we go. Now, a really big part of X3D, I think, a really big merit is that. Uh, the notions are consistent. We don't redefine terms. We don't change the semantics, the meaning, the usage, the uh, understanding of how these things work, but rather we're carefully reapplying it and putting the pieces together, the different building blocks and ways that make sense for each subsequent change. Okay? So, congratulations. That means all of your knowledge so far should uh, be very useful in this chapter and make it uh, a little easier to work with. Okay, so uh, motivation, motivation for this chapter. Why do we need triangles? Why do we need rectangles and quadrilaterals? Okay, we already have those already, right? We have index face set and face set lets us put together triangles, we have uh, the rectangle 2D node. So it is a very good question. Why do we really need these things? Okay, um, well, we've talked before about tessellation. The definition of geometry and then the subdivision of that geometric shape into triangles. Okay, a lot of our previous nodes did exactly that. For example, sphere. We don't tell it where every triangle is. We simply say, here's the radius of the sphere, and we let the X3D viewer do all that computation for us. That's a good thing. But it exists nevertheless. Whether we're doing it or the tool's doing it, this triangulation takes place. So there are use cases, there are examples where you say, aha, I would want to have that level of fine grained control, that tight control over where the triangles are. Maybe it's not the browser I want to depend on, where the sphere might look a little different in each different browser because they chose a different resolution. Maybe, maybe I want to decide how exact, how finely detailed my sphere is. Maybe instead of 128 uh, polygons, I want 1,024 or 4,096. I want a really smooth sphere. Okay? And I'm willing to write a little program to compute those, adapt a program and define those triangles exactly. Okay, this gives you that option. And it further gives you the option to do it in a way that's consistent with the underlying graphics hardware. Okay? Uh, if we said that the top three considerations for 3D graphics, if you recall, the top three considerations, performance, performance, performance. Okay? So this is how graphics hardware is designed. This is how it has evolved over time. Performance is paramount. And to accomplish that performance, hardware has taken some very simple steps and it does them really well. The types of things that it does really well is drawing triangles. They can get blindingly, screamingly fast about getting pushed triangles and rendering them and changing just a little bit, but not that whole set of geometry for the triangles. And it can draw and draw and draw and draw and draw those all day long very quickly. The benefit to us is we see a fast frame rate. We see a good uh, interactive, interesting scene. So, why these nodes are available then are to help expose that 
high performance functionality all the way up to the scene author, all the way up to the end user, and, and not depend on the uh, intermediation, if you will, not depend on the browser's role in the middle there, but just say, I want full control over what's going to the graphics card. Okay, so there's an uh, interesting uh, push pull on here then about what's uh, high level and what's low level. And uh, let's discuss that just a little bit. High versus low level. Okay, so high level usually refers to uh, more abstract, more general, more uh, conceptual. Low level usually refers to way right down in the details. And well, yes, where indeed is that vertex there and that one there and that one there? So uh, you can think of the triangle nodes and the quad nodes as low level because they are highly detailed. We're defining points rather than saying, give me a cylinder or give me a sphere. Okay? Uh, but at the same time, they're high performance because they're already in a form that the graphics card can do the most high performance rendering of. So there is a discussion of this uh, uh, in the notes for this page. If we take a look at that, you can uh, see some of it here. Uh, I, I suggest you read that. In fact, there's plenty of notes in this chapter, and they're, they're worth your while. I won't go over every one of them in the presentation, but they are there for you to look at. So uh, you can get comfortable with the notion of uh, high level and low level. And there's even a little background uh, history here. And that is, uh, they were not originally in the triangle and the quad nodes, not in the original uh, Vermal 97 specification. Okay? They were felt to be unnecessary. Hey, we had index face set. You can define any triangles you want in that. You can define any quadrilaterals. But as time went on and more practice uh, was uh, understood, as our understanding of, of these capabilities deepened, we decided as a group, the X3D working group decided, we will add low-level triangle, low-level quadrilateral support in X3D for authors that want to use it. So there you go. I think we all benefit from that change. Okay. So, a little bit of that review then. So, uh, uh, we've seen some of these notions before, that the triangles are what's used by the 3D. Uh, that reduction in software pays a lot of benefits. You can think of it as a form of uh, pre-processing when uh, that triangularization, that tessellation occurs and that helps performance and that then plays to the strong suit the strength of the hardware which is uh, draw quickly. Now another benefit of triangles is that uh, by definition a triangle defines a plane. So we don't have to worry about whether our polygonization, our tessellation becomes non-planar. Because it's a, those non-planar ambiguities are bad. So uh, getting to triangles is always a good thing. And uh, uh, correspondingly, great care must be taken when you use quadrilaterals or larger polygons, five-sided, six-sided, eight-sided, hundred-sided polygons. Got to, there are definitely issues to watch out for on that. Okay. Uh, next review concept is the notion of single-sided polygons. Okay, this should be quite familiar. You know, we can do half the work on drawing if we only draw the half that the user sees. That sounds good. The trick, of course, is which half does the user see? Uh, uh, 
we want to get it right. And and uh, this is like the uh, the joke I told uh, earlier about uh, the greatest invention in the history of the world, the thermos bottle, because it keeps hot things hot, cold things cold. Mm, which doesn't sound too impressive until you ponder. Mm, but how does it know? Okay, how do we know which side of the polygon to draw? That's sometimes tricky. Uh, so, uh, if we can do single-sided polygons, we definitely prefer them. And usually the decision about whether to go single or double-sided is very much model-driven. What is it we're drawing? What is the geometry? Do we need to see inside that brick? Probably not. Do we need to see both sides of the wall? Probably yes. Okay. There is a technical term for this uh, single-sided drawing, and that's called backface culling. Backface meaning the reverse face, the backside of that. Culling means throw that out of the drawing uh, chain, the, the drawing loop that renders the polygons. We want to get rid of the other side. Why? Because triangles by themselves aren't magic. We don't throw them in there. The, the computer has to decide if I'm drawing this side or I'm drawing the other side separately because they get different lighting effects. They uh, uh, will look quite possibly very different when they're drawn. So uh, both sides of the triangle are not created equally. They're not displayed equally. Backface culling gets rid of it. Proper rendering keeps it and shows it both sides if need be. Okay. And then uh, we've also heard this a few times before. It's worth pounding the table on. And that's uh, uh, whose efficiency is more important, the graphics card or your own? If you have geometry that you can't even see or can't even find because you're on the wrong side of a one-sided polygon, then maybe it's time to reveal that and change the default to solid equals false and that will force both sides of your polygon to render that will force the graphics card to display it that will allow you the end user the author to wherever you are in that world you'll be able to see oh, oh there's my geometry right over there great oh i see i had my polygon turned backwards i should flip the counterclockwise bit or I should uh, redefine the numbers so that they're in the proper order right hand rule to show it. Okay, So rather than that long story a much simpler answer is solid equals false shows both sides. And then once you got it squared away you can uh, possibly revert to uh, the solid equals true once you're confident that you're on the right side of the polygon can deal with. Okay, helpful hint. What's our other uh, field? Other fields here. So the next one is solid. And solid, as you hopefully recall, uh, is something we learned way back in chapter two, the primitive geometry. And uh, this tells whether or not a shape that we're drawing has an inside. Okay, so it's maybe a misnomer, solid, it's kind of counterintuitive. Uh, you might think of, of something with one side as perhaps less solid or less substantial. That's the wrong way to think of that. Think about a brick. If it's solid like a brick, we only need to draw the outside. We don't need to get inside the brick and, and draw the interior polygons because our viewpoint should never be there. All right. So. Uh, the solid falls draws both sides. Um, we uh, have that nice example back in the primitives that shows uh, the difference between uh, solid true uh, and looking on one side of a polygon or looking on the other. And the key, key here is our text had the default solid true, meaning single sided, and when we rotated the view of our scene to uh, this other perspective when we flipped around 
those three things, then what was missing is the text. And not seen. Why? Because we are on the far side of the polygons and not visible. Okay. Next up. All right, now normal vectors. We described them earlier, but we really didn't do anything with them before. So let's look at the definition, and then in a few slides we'll get into the um, uh, how does it work really if we want to override defaults. Okay, so uh, first normal is a strict mathematical term here, and it doesn't, it's not the sense of usual or ordinary, but rather normal perpendicular, okay, at right angles to the individual triangle or individual polygon. What is the perpendicular there? And we'll see shortly that that perpendicular defines how does light come in and how is it reflected out? What is the angle? What is the intensity of this interaction? And that incident and reflection angle have to be equal uh, about the normal. So the normal indicates what the bounce off angle is, all right, that perpendicular. Now how do we define normals? How can we predict them? Well, uh, there's a picture and a description right here. First is, uh, given a, a polygon, uh, if we want to figure out where is the perpendicular for that, where is the perpendicular coming out, and we take our polygon and we use our good old right hand rule. And by choosing the order of points in the polygon, 0, 1, 2, 3, the order that they're defined, we take the curve of our right hand and let that curve start at the heel of the thumb and go out pointing along the fingers, pointing in the direction of increasing values. So if zero is here, I would put my right hand, zero, one, two, three, and now my thumb is pointing in the perpendicular normal direction, the direction of the normal vector for that. So this is how we figure it out. Now, how does the computer do it? Well, it doesn't have a little hand. We have a hand, picture here, and you, you hopefully can use your right hand to, to look at some of these things and line up your, the base of your, th your, your thing right there, and then uh, here we are curving our fingers to match across there. And then finally we are able to com see the computation of the direction of the normal, normal perpendicular. Now the computer doesn't use this. The computer actually has a geometrical formula that computes the points for the triangle and by doing uh, uh, cross products is able to compute the vector direction and also the vector magnitude. Now because we usually don't care, you know, one triangle can't have be more perpendicular than another. We usually don't bother with how big a value is. We always normalize it. We reduce it to a value of one, make it unit length. Okay, let's uh, make sure we're covering everything here. Yep, I think so. Okay, so the next field, uh, counterclockwise, CCW, and that is trying to describe whether or not the triangle is defined in the way we expect. If we look at the preceding slide, and we can say, if this triangle by default meets graphics conventions, then the right-hand rule applies. It's a counterclockwise defined that. And, and so the way to think about that is, well, what if this was the face of a clock? And maybe we're at, uh, let's see, there's uh, if we're at uh, 3 p.m., then our clock face would look something like this.
Okay, so there's a clock face at Okay, so if we figure out the normal there, then we say, oh, okay, our right-hand rule points in a counterclockwise direction. So it's really that simple. Imagine a clock on there. And so what happens, though, if we define the polygon and uh, it so happened that all of the numbers that we got uh, let's say it's 0, 1, 2, but instead of this side being the front, the back side was intended to be the front. Okay, It would be very tedious to have to go through and take this long number of floats and switch the order around and go, oh gee, we're sorry, we made a mistake, we got to fix it, let's reorder the points so that they can form to this convention. Uh, rather than do that, we simply give you a boolean to say whether or not it matches the default ordering for uh, uh, where the front side is or not. So that if the points came from a different tool or perhaps had just been mistakenly entered in a backwards direction, then we could, rather than recopying and pasting and maybe making errors when we do that, we can instead say, okay, it's not counterclockwise, which is the default, but instead it's the opposite, it's counterclockwise. So this is how we would fix problems in data. Okay, so that's a nice convenience. So uh, this is a little bit of review, uh, and if you've taken data as part of one of your projects already, this, this will probably be pretty familiar and you'll be grateful for, for this field. It was useful. Um, I guess maybe one thing uh, we could point out here is uh, when would counterclockwise be irrelevant? When would it be irrele irrelevant? Uh, answer Well, let's say mostly irrelevant. Maybe there's some special cases, but it's irrelevant if you have two-sided polygons. Okay, so we use counterclockwise when we're trying to be very precise about let's draw only one side and let's draw the correct side of those two. If we're drawing both, mm, clockwise, counterclockwise, doesn't matter so much. It will flip the normal vector which side it's on because the ordering is this way or the ordering is that way. But if we're drawing both sides, it doesn't matter. So there you go. Okay, so what's another common field? Color per vertex. Okay, color per vertex uh, is pretty simple. Do we have one color for each point in a polygon? each vertex in a polygon, or do we have a single color for each polygonal face? So here are examples for that. Um, we have um, uh, in this slide uh, two examples done two ways. Uh, we have uh, solid examples on the left, and then uh, well, let's see, that's not so clear. Let's try again. In polygon A, it's filled in with a different color for each vertex. For polygon B, we have uh, a single color for the whole polygon. And then we went to wireframe mode on the right to help do that. So this might not be quite visible unless you look closely at here. I don't have a rainbow pen but I'll outline the uh, rainbow colors here in the wireframe mode. The lines do show the colors there and that would be um, polygon C and then over here in polygon D we have a single color for the pole polygon so that means the color per vertex false and thus we get uh, the single red outline, the first color, applies to that whole polygon. 
Okay, and so our values are uh, listed at the very bottom of the page. And uh, what it actually means is uh, right up here, if color per vertex is true, then the uh, number of colors must equal or be greater than equal to the number of points. However, if it's color per vertex false, then you simply need enough colors to match the number of polygons. So if we're drawing triangles, that's a reduction of one-third. You only need a third as many uh, uh, colors because there's only a third as many polygons as there are points when we're drawing a triangle. Similarly, it'll be a, a quarter of that for rectangles, for quadrilaterals. Okay, so here's another review, uh, color per vertex examples. Uh, that's the same diagram we were looking at a second ago, uh, down at the bottom of the screen, but this shows uh, how did we draw this in X3D. And you can see that we're not using the nodes in this chapter, but rather our good old dependables from before, index face set, and index line set are how we actually drew these examples. Okay, another review field is normal per vertex. Very similar to color per vertex, is it number of normals equal the number of points or number of normals equal the number of polygons? And when we say normals here, we're talking about individual normal vectors that are being defined for each polygon and provided as part of the scene. Okay, so let's check the notes on that. Yeah. Okay, that's very good. So I think what we'll do now is uh, take a break. And when we come back, we'll continue with the concepts and uh, we'll specifically look at what are our normal vectors doing and then we'll look at our first node. So let's go back to our list then. What we've completed is these uh, first set of common fields. So next up will be how do we do normal vectors and how do we do a triangle set, applying these together in a single node. Okay, see you in the next session.